Once again, we'd like to welcome you to the Lake Travis Church of Christ. We are glad that each and every one of you are here this morning. The thing is, is that we are blessed by your presence. And we pray that we can be a blessing to each and every one of you this morning. God is good all the time, right? And all the good, all the time. God is good. Amen. Well, you know what? Uh, victory is mine. Peace is mine. Joy is mine. But victory is also yours. Peace is yours. Joy is yours. Now, I don't have the words to these songs up to, up to the song this morning, but you know what? Just sing with your heart. Okay? Just sing with your heart. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. The victory is mine. I told Satan, victory is mine. The victory is mine. Peace is mine. Peace is mine. Peace today is mine. I told Satan, peace is mine. Why do we come together? 
Why do we worship as we come together? Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Why do we take communion? Why do we do these things? Why do we do this week after week? By whose authority do we do these things? Um, I want you to think for a moment, but by what authority do we obey traffic signs? Think about that for a moment. What if we had no recognized standard of authority for street traffic? What if that wasn't true? I mean, if we had no standard. Depending on where you're from, some of you would insist on driving on the left side of the street, and others of you would insist on driving on the other side of the street. That wouldn't go over too well. This would be a recipe for disaster. The number of fatalities would increase greatly. Last week we mentioned the importance in the understanding of measurements. I mean, if you recall that. Do you remember that? I mean, if you remember, we said, <laughs> and you know this, that 12 inches equals a what? A foot. There's 16 ounces to a what? A pound. 2,000 pounds make a what? A ton. We understand these standards. We get it. But wouldn't all of us agree that a recognized standard of authority is essential to peace and unity as well? Wouldn't you agree with that? We know that Jesus told his disciples on the mountain of Galilee. He said that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he gives them very special instructions, right? Therefore, because all authority has been given to me in heaven, on earth and in heaven. I want you to do something. I want you to go out into all the world. Go out to all nations. Do what? Making disciples and doing what? Baptizing them in the name of what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, he says, teaching them to do what? To obey everything that I command." Amen? Amen? Today our sermon title is By What Authority? By What Authority? A friend of mine was pulled over a few weeks ago and lights were flashing and sirens were glaring and blaring and, and then she saw a police officer with a gun on his side and uh, his shiny badge that sparkled in the sunlight as he approached her car window. It was clear by what authority she was pulled over. Just like my friend who recognized the authority because she could visibly see it. The question for us this morning, can we recognize the authority that we as Christians live under according to the scriptures? We know that Jesus died for the church and the church is his body. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28 says that Jesus bought the church with his own blood. God's authority is supreme. He instructed men to write the Bible. And we go through God the Son to reach God the Father, and we have the Holy Spirit who helps to lead us and to guide us into all truths. We are the church. We, the people, are the church. This is us. When we submit to the proper authority, guess what? We work together. We work together in tandem in order to glorify God. Now the key is working together. Those of you who would be willing to volunteer, I sent out an email last week, and we have a couple more things on the list of things of volunteers. Many of you uh, are greeters, and you do many other things, and we need more greeters, because as people come into the fold, people who come into our congregation, we want to be able to welcome them warmly. Um, I added a couple other things, and we are looking for someone to lead the ministry over the side. We have a couple of sign ministries going on, and we need somebody to head that up. Uh, to put our signs out, I mean, to lead that. 
We also have our manners uh, that need to be um, headed up as well. We have combined our, our community uh, potluck with our uh, monthly uh, potluck that we have starting today. Next month, for every single month, for the next 12 months, we need somebody to head that up and to get those banners out. It's just, I mean, we need for you to do that. Many of you volunteer for many different things, and we ask that you continue to do that. That's great when we work together. Remington, or Brother Remington volunteers for the PowerPoint slides, along with maps. The Nunleys uh, volunteer to actually put the bulletin together on a weekly basis. They do a fantastic job with that. Keith uh, started the uh, men's breakfast ministry. Linda, she is the one who prints our bulletins and brings these beautiful flowers that you see up here every week. Patrick volunteers for um, updating the, the website um, on a weekly basis. Bryce volunteers for our putting, putting the power slides, uh, PowerPoint slides together. Bryce also is in charge of getting all of the men scheduled for leading singing throughout 2016 and beyond. So those of you who would uh, want to continue to volunteer, or those who feel inclined to volunteer, we would welcome that. This is just one aspect of us working together. Just one aspect. Look with me in Romans chapter 12, if you would, and we're going to look in verse number 5. It says, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. Do you know what Paul is saying here? He's saying we are all a part of the same entity. And since we are all members of one body and we're joined together, we should be working together. We should also be looking out for each other and taking care of one another. <laughs> and if you remember a couple of weeks ago, my wife, uh, her toe met the wall and she broke her little baby toe. So on Thanksgiving morning, we spent a couple of hours in the emergency room. And do you know what happened? When she, when the wall met her toe, because I don't know where the wall came from, but it just appeared all of a sudden. But when the wall met her toe, every member of her body gravitated down to that toe and immediately went to that toe. And it comforted that toe. Every member of her body did that. This is a part of what the body of Christ should be about. Amen? When one of us rejoices, we all should be rejoicing. When one of us is hurting, we all should be comforting that one. That is what the body of Christ does. When we don't recognize by what authority we live by, by honoring God and putting Him first into our lives, things can go wrong. They can go candy walks. <clears throat> Be all out of sorts. When parts of the body don't work together, hurtful things happen. By the authority of Jesus, he says to love your neighbors as yourself. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when they also were answering and saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? And stranger and needy clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you. Jesus said, I tell you this, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Three things I want you to notice, and I want you to open up your bulletins and take notes if you have a pen or a pencil. Three things I want you to know about authority and how we get authority wrong. First of all, some people elevate a feeling as authority. Some people elevate a feeling as 
has authority. The key word is feeling. They will say that what I'm feeling gives me the authority to do what I want to do. But think about it for a moment. If, if all of us would accept feeling as authority, as the supreme measurement, that would wipe out all religious confusion and please God, right? That would wipe everything out. I mean, if that's the case, then let's do that. But that's not the case. That's the problem. We don't have a standard recognized by all when it comes to feelings. Everyone feels differently about a certain situation or a certain thing. How to raise your kids. How to pay bills. How to spend your money or how to treat others. Or how to respond to a, a certain situation. Either to allow a certain religious group in, to enter into the U.S. or not. This is why there's so much confusion when it comes to these things and comes to feelings. Feelings won't do as a standard. They just won't do. Because they don't always run parallel with God's authority. Why? Because God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. And when we don't like His ways and don't feel like obeying Him, well, we need to grow up. We need to grow up spiritually in the Lord in Him and then obey Him anyway. By studying God's Word. Secondly, some use their conscience as their authority. Some use their conscience as their authority. Many people say my conscience is my God. That's my authority. I let my conscience direct my footsteps. Proverbs 3 and verse 6 said, In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. It's him who's going to make it straight. Jeremiah 29 and verse number 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But consciousness vary depending on your life experience. <coughs> Wouldn't you agree with that? Also, it depends on your culture, what your background. Paul was persecuting the church, and his conscience at that time thought he was doing right. But later he found out that he was do doing what was contrary to the will of God. What he was doing was wrong. He thought he was right because his consciousness was telling him, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Proverbs 16, 25 says, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Destruction. Proverbs 28, 25, the greedy stir up conflict, but those who trust in the Lord will prosper. Is consciousness, or is conscience good enough to use as a standard? Is conscience good to use as a standard? No. Third, some use their father and mother as authoritative figures. Some use their father and mother as authoritative figures. Some say my father and mother are good people, and I'm going to follow them and do what they taught me. <coughs> well, I mean, but that's Good. I mean, I mean, that's okay if it's according to the will of God. <coughs> Paul followed his forefathers, but it wasn't right. Look with me in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 14. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. 
Was he pleasing God while he was following his forefathers? No. He was persecuting Christians. That's what he was doing. Will the religion of forefathers land us safely on the other shore? Not necessarily. We cannot follow them unless their walk is in harmony, is in line with his will. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even his own self, such a person cannot be my disciple. In other words, esteem God in his will above yourselves, above everyone else. You know what scripture is clear that Jesus died for the church and he gave himself for it? Do you know that salvation is found in no one else? No other name under heaven given to mankind by which we can be saved. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, he said that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the word of God. It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the word of God. So, why do we worship? Why do we do what we do? Why do we uh, come here on a weekly basis? Why do we pray to the Father through his son, Jesus Christ? Why do we just worship and come here on a weekly basis? Well, number one, God tells us to. That's why. God tells us to. Attendance for God's people, his saints, is mandatory according to Hebrews chapter 10. He gives us special instructions and not to give up meaning. In verse number 24, starting in verse number 24, he said, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. If we keep meeting together in worship, you know what's going to happen? We keep fellowshipping with one another. This will help keep Satan at bay. Keep Satan at a distance. We are a body of believers. We are a building. A holy people. A holy nation. A royal priesthood. Also, when we worship together on a weekly basis, do you know what happens? Fellowship and edification with other believers happens. We are blessed when we come together. It promotes encouragement with each other. Guess what? We all need encouragement, don't we? Every single one of us, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Then he goes over in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 19. He says, let us therefore make every effort, every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual Mutual edification. And lastly, we worship on a weekly basis because we enjoy the benefits of collective worship. Coming together collectively, we get to commune as one body of believers and enjoy more in-depth relationships with one another. We get to know each other. We're going to have a, a potluck today. And I hope all of you stay where we can get to shake one another's hands, get to pray with you, pray for you, get to hug on you and love you, and just share in a meal, have a conversation with one another. This is how we get to know each other better. By spending time with our brothers and sisters. If we isolate ourselves, we don't get the benefit of building our relationships. We don't get the benefit of spirituality. And the more we do that, the better off we are. 
we get the opportunity to publicly proclaim the blood, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we get to do. So, one of the things I want you to remember is this. Is that Jesus has all authority. All authority was given to him in heaven and on earth. Therefore, he says, go into all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, that's all things that I have commanded. I mean, your bulletins, it says in Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 17, this is what it says. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Giving thanks to the Father through him. Again, Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you know what Paul was saying there? He said, respect authority. Last week we started our series off on the necessity of authority. Today we talked about, about by what authority. Next week we're going to look at respect for authority. Respect for authority. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? In public and in private. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know in Romans chapter 10, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1 says, therefore, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? That you've got to be in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse number 10 says that if you believe in your heart, first you've got to be able to believe, and then you're justified. But then you've got to be able to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that He is the one that saves us from our sins. He's the one. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Say it like you mean it. Amen? Amen. We are here for you. We love you. We want you to know that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, you have that opportunity to do that this morning. And if there's something we can pray with you about, we would love to do that. Some of you have a heavy heart and you're not sharing that. We're open to do that. The elders are here. Look at the ministers are here. We're open to doing that. If you want to receive Jesus Christ into your heart this morning, into your lives, you can do that by accepting his word, his saving grace, and you can put him on in baptism this morning. The water may be a little bit cold, but guess what? You'll come up on fire for Jesus Christ. Why don't you come as we together stand and sing this song?